John and Sarah are father and daughter who planned their holiday together. They chose the Dominican Republic as the destination and they were looking forward to the trip. The weather was great and they could visit the country's beautiful beaches. Two weeks after their return, however, the man and his daughter became ill. They developed fever and body aches. John knew that something was wrong and so they immediately went to the hospital. The doctors looked at them and came to the conclusion that both suffered from the flu. So they prescribed standard treatments and the father and his daughter were sent back home. But the drugs didn't help and their condition got worse. Especially Sarah felt awful. For days she had no appetite and developed a headache. Then one morning she fainted, breathed fast, her heart was racing and the blood pressure was low. They once more rushed to the hospital where the doctors tried to raise her blood pressure to buy some time. In the meantime they conducted some tests and found out that Sarah had damages in her liver and very low levels of red blood cells. Slowly it became clear. John and Sarah suffered from malaria. Each year over 220 million people develop malaria and over 400,000 people die from the disease. Scientists try to find a way to eradicate malaria with little success so far, until now. Soon we might have a breakthrough in the fight against malaria. My name is Kevin Steinek and today we'll see how we might eradicate malaria. Malaria is caused by five types of a parasite called Plasmodium. More serious forms of malaria are usually caused by Plasmodium falciparum, which is contracted by mosquitoes. If an infected mosquito bites us, it injects the parasites into the bloodstream. Although the immune system recognizes the parasites and starts to attack them, some escape to the liver. Here Plasmodium remains inactive for a couple of days, but then starts to multiply. This process can destroy surrounding tissues, which is why the doctors discovered damages to Sarah's liver. The newborn parasites then change the form and start to infect red blood cells. This is normally when symptoms become worse. Sarah, for example, experienced fever and body aches. When more and more red blood cells have been destroyed, the body starts to lack oxygen. The lack of oxygen then causes a stress response. We saw that in Sarah when she started to breathe fast and her heart started to race. At this stage, malaria can have detrimental consequences if we don't treat it. More and more parasites are made and the body becomes overwhelmed. Parasite-filled blood cells can block blood vessels in the brain and cause seizures and coma. Malaria can also damage the kidneys or liver or cause the spleen to rupture. Once malaria has reached this stage, it becomes life-threatening. Fortunately, malaria can be treated quite well. One of the most frequently administered drugs against malaria is chloroquine phosphate. This drug accumulates in a parasite and makes it burst. If administered at the right time, chloroquine phosphate kills more and more parasites and the person recovers. Unfortunately, plasmodium can become resistant against this drug and so other therapies have been developed. This includes melarone or artemisinin-based combination therapies. In John and Sarah's case, both were immediately treated when the doctors realized they had malaria. John had an uncomplicated form of the disease and he recovered quickly. His daughter was not so lucky as her symptoms were more severe. She needed to receive transfusions and was given a cocktail of drugs. After a couple of days, the drugs started to work and she became better. Sarah was discharged after two weeks, but she had to undergo physical therapy afterwards. For the next months, the father and his daughter felt fatigue, but in the end, they recovered. Malaria is a big threat in countries all around the world. Although the number of malaria cases are slightly falling, the parasite still affects over 220 million people each year. The highest malaria transmission is found in Africa, south of the Sahara and in parts of Oceania including Papua New Guinea. We've once covered how malaria changed the blood in people, especially in these regions. Although malaria has already been eliminated in Western Europe, the United States and China, Plasmodium spreads in other countries. In Venezuela, for example, the number of malaria cases have increased by over 76% between 2015 and 2016. So we need to find ways to fight back and eradicate malaria. And scientists have worked out some plans. Some of the ideas are quite crazy, but they might work. The first plan is already quite old and has been put into practice in many countries. The idea is to distribute insecticides and nets to prevent malaria outbreaks. The most common insecticides against mosquitoes include DDT, Dieldrin or Malefion. Although insecticides are effective against mosquitoes, they also can become resistant which has made some efforts less successful. 
Nets have been proven to be effective and reduce the number of malaria cases in high-risk areas. The next plan to eradicate malaria is to develop a malaria vaccine. Vaccines have already helped us to make some diseases extinct, including smallpox and hopefully poliomyelitis soon. But there are some reasons why it is difficult to make a vaccine against malaria. Vaccines work the following way. They contain parts of viruses or parasites which are recognized by the immune system. The immune system then learns to destroy these particles. So if the respective virus or parasite tries to enter our body, it is immediately fight off by the immune system. A major question for vaccine development is which part of a virus or parasite is used as a target. Is it more effective to train the immune system to attack this or this part? In viruses, we often only have a handful of different possible choices. In COVID-19, for example, we choose a protein on the surface of the virus as a target as it is in direct contact with the immune system. Plasmodium, the parasite which causes malaria on the other hand, contains thousands of different proteins. This means that we would need to develop numerous of vaccines to determine the best targets. Moreover, plasmodium undergoes a transformation during the infection. In the liver, the parasite looks very different from advanced stages where it infects red blood cells. These transformations make the development of a vaccine much more complicated, as the immune system might recognize one, but not the other form. Nonetheless, two good vaccine candidates have been developed so far. The first vaccine is called RTS-SAS10 and successfully completed phase 3 testing. Whoa, that sounds like Elon Musk's child. It could be commercially available one day, but the efficiency right now is only at 39%. And that's an issue, as we would require an efficiency of 75% to eradicate malaria. The second vaccine has been developed by the University of Oxford and is currently being tested. This year it was given to 450 children and showed an efficiency of 77%, which is what we need. So the next goal here is to test the vaccine in larger populations and see if it's still effective. And now we come to the third plan, which more sounds like the plot of a science fiction movie. Some scientists plan to eradicate malaria and other diseases through gene editing. Gene editing is a technique where we add or destroy genes in an organism. There are different methods for gene editing, one of the most famous being CRISPR-Cas9. In CRISPR, we use the Cas9 protein to cut DNA at a specific location while providing another piece of DNA. The cell then recognizes that the DNA has been broken and tries to seal the break by incorporating the imported DNA. In this manner, we can provide organisms with new genes which give them new abilities. To combat malaria, scientists are now trying to insert genes into mosquitoes which make them toxic for plasmodium. This means that the parasite cannot survive in genetically modified mosquitoes and people do not become infected. In first experiments, scientists gave this gene to mosquitoes and observed that malaria parasites indeed started to die in the guts. The important point here is that the mosquitoes themselves were healthy, only the parasite died. What we could do now is that we could locally release these mosquitoes in high-risk areas to kill the parasite. But of course this raises ethical questions, whether we can really use genetically modified organisms in nature. In a similar approach, scientists did not try to make mosquitoes malaria resistant, but try to reduce the number of mosquitoes. In this case, male mosquitoes are genetically modified. These mosquitoes are healthy and can mate with females, but cannot produce female offsprings. This should then overall reduce the number of mosquitoes, while preventing the genetically engineered mosquitoes to completely take over. And this concept is currently being tested. A couple of weeks ago, the genetically modified male mosquitoes have been released in Florida, but also in Brazil, Panama and Malaysia earlier. Scientists now track how their mosquito populations change locally and I'll keep you updated on the channel. But for now I have two questions for you. Do you support the notion of using genetically modified mosquitoes to eradicate deadly diseases? And what should I cover next? Also subscribe if you're new here and hit the bell button. And with that, I'll see ya. Some people have mutations in their DNA which makes them immune against malaria. Find out more about amazing mutants here. If you're interested in brain parasites which hide in over 2 billion people, click on this video here.